try it again. Good evening. <laughs> Very nice. So my name is C.B. Bharacharya, and uh, I am the Zoffer Chair for Sustainability and Ethics uh, at the Katz Graduate School, and also the director of the Center for Sustainable Business that we just launched uh, last October. And today it's my, my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the inaugural lecture in the Center for Sustainable Business lecture series. Um, so we're co-hosting this event with our partners at the Global Studies Center in the University Center for International Studies. And soon I shall hand over the mic to Michael Goodhart, who will do the formal introduction for our speaker. Um, as part of our mission to help companies learn how to adopt a more sustainable approach across all functions of the organization, we aim to train and educate all of our students as sustainability generalists. Um, part of that mission entails exposing you all to different ideas and approaches to the study of how companies interact with the stakeholders in the communities in which they operate. Uh, to that end, uh, we couldn't have thought of a better person to invite and to have here today. Uh, we are very, very pleased to welcome the esteemed Dr. Sherin Hartel, Associate Professor at the University of Connecticut. So um, I would like now to invite uh, Dr. Michael Goodhart, Professor of Political Science and Director of the Global Studies Center to formally introduce Dr. Hartel. Uh, thanks, CB, and also um, to Leslie for all the work you did um, organizing this event. We're delighted to be partnering with the Center for Sustainable Business, and we just want to congratulate you on the fantastic start that the center has, has gotten off to. Uh, as CB mentioned, this is the inaugural uh, event in the center's new lecture series. Our speaker today, uh, Dr. Shireen Hertel, is also the inaugural Heinz Visiting Fellow at the Global Studies Center. The aim of this short-term fellowship program is to increase the impact of visits by external scholars beyond the normal fly-in, give a talk, have a meal, and fly-out model, uh, by instead bringing them to campus for longer stays so that they uh, can have greater interactions with faculty, students, and staff. So just to that end, let me mention two other opportunities you'll have to, three other opportunities to engage with Professor Hertel. Tomorrow at 12.30, I'm looking at Leslie because I want to make sure I get the information right, 12.30 p.m. at University Club Ballroom B. Uh, there's a panel on uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. The exact name of the panel is escaping me, but we'll be talking about the role of business in promoting social equity through the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, also, on Wednesday at noon, uh, there, uh, we'll be uh, having a brown bag workshop on Professor Hertel's uh, work in progress, Elusive Accountability in Business and Human Rights. Popular Perceptions of Governance Gaps. If you need to copy that paper, you could see me after or just check out the Global Studies Center website. Uh, and then she's also available for office hours meetings. And again, if you need details about how to sign up, you could see me afterwards. So now it's my privilege and pleasure to introduce my good friend, uh, Shireen Hertel, who, as CB mentioned, is Associate Professor, though I think imminently to be Professor uh, of Political Science at the University of Connecticut. Shireen and I met as PhD students in New York in the late 90s. <clears throat> Both of us were interested in human rights, which at that time was a topic that was only beginning to receive sustained scholarly attention from political scientists. Uh, over the years, that's changed, uh, in no small part thanks to Shireen's labors, both as editor of the Interdisciplinary Journal of Human Rights and as a founding co-organizer of the Economic Rights Group at the University of Connecticut's Human Rights Institute. Shireen is a scholar of economic rights, social movements, and global supply chains. <clears throat> In particular, she focuses on grassroots activism around social and economic rights from a broadly comparative perspective, one informed by ethnography, international relations, social and political theory, and social movement studies. Her scholarship draws on over 20 years of policy work with the United Nations agencies, foundations, and non-governmental organizations in the United States, Latin America, and South Asia. Her 2006 book, Unexpected Power, Conflict and Change Among Transnational Activists, was a major contribution to our understanding of transnational advocacy frameworks in which she explored the tensions and the negotiations that characterize relations among various local social justice movements and international human rights NGOs. 
focusing on child labor campaigns in Bangladesh and women right, women's rights movements in the Mexican Maquiladoras. She detailed some of the mechanisms through which local groups exert surprising degrees of power and autonomy in framing and executing their campaigns. Her more recent work illuminates unexpected and typically neglected aspects of norm emergence, diffusion, and change, with attention to both ground-level mechanisms through which these processes occur and their theoretical implications. The two primary case studies on which she's focused more recently are the Right to Food campaign in India and beyond, and on corporate social responsibility and stakeholder dialogue, the subject of her 2019 Oxford University Press book, Tethered Fates, Companies, Communities, and Rights at Stake, which you'll hear more about as soon as I stop talking, which I promise will be in just one second. Uh, Shireen's impressive scholarly accomplishments also include her work as co-editor of two important volumes in the field, Economic Rights, Conceptual Measurement, and Policy Issues from Cambridge in 2007 with Lance Minkler, and Human Rights in the United States, Beyond Exceptionalism, also from Cambridge in 2011 with Kathy Lebron. She's also written multiple articles and book chapters. She earned her doctorate in political science, as well as a master's in political science and in international affairs from Columbia University, and her BA in international relations from the College of Worcester. I can't think of a scholar whose work better speaks to the mission of the CSB or aligns better with the transnational focus of the Global Studies Center. So I'm delighted to introduce to you Shereen. I am so grateful to be here. It is a joy and a privilege and with such a lovely introduction. I should stop now and let you all go have a great dinner. Um, but I'm very grateful to Michael for kind of outlining the, the arc of my work beginning with our mutual engagement in a dissertation writing group at Columbia. Michael was visiting in New York at the time, and I think we were both really in, in some ways discouraged from doing this strange work in human rights. Nobody was really going to read it, maybe a few international lawyers. And what we found now is that some of the most compelling work that either of us do, both as scholars but as scholar advocates and practitioners, is around this uh, translational work, making human rights make sense to multiple constituencies. So for me, it's a real privilege to be a Heinz Fellow, to be here in a school of business, and as your dean said, to be doing work that makes sense to people in the school of business because you know what stakeholders mean, but also makes sense to political theorists, political scientists of multiple stripes, and to scholars in a range of other, both applied and tr more traditional disciplines. So I'm gonna talk about the book pretty quickly and then my hope is to leave a lot of time and ample opportunity for you to ask me questions. My stay here is punctuated both with this work, um, with this uh, global studies to engage around the sustainable development goals, but I've also had the privilege of meeting with colleagues of yours who do licensing and procurement for the university. So thinking about translating the work that we do in the academy into real practice in the purchasing of food products and other things that we eat, wear, and use. And one of the things I think that's very exciting is thinking about this project as one that is a stakeholder project that engages all of us. A stakeholder is a person affected by business activity, whether they eat, wear, use the product, or whether they work for the company. And so in this picture alone, you're able to look at a range of books. Mine is part of an arc of scholarship, but you're also looking at two pieces of my field work here on the far left, a hang tag, off of a, an item you might find in your very own bookstore that says, my son goes to school because of these clothes, marketed by the Alta Gracia Corporation, as Professor Chang and I were talking about today, credible commitment to um, uh, ethical supply chain management manifested in the way the product is advertised, and then a picture of corporate social responsibility type activities, corporate philanthropy activities carried out by the Haynes Corporation. These are two very different types of corporate engagement models. I'm looking in those two communities in the qualitative part of the book. And so my hope is today we think not only in an abstract sense about stakeholders, but how we are all implicated in the choices we make on products we use. I say often to students, because I teach in both political science and in human rights at UConn, um, you will make infinitely more consumption choices than you will ever vote. As a political scientist, I want all my students to vote, but we've made multiple consumption choices in the course of just getting here to this point in our day, manifoldly more than we will ever make as a, as a formal voter. And so those choices are very consequentialist. Um, when we think about the environment, and I did this slide in, in, in part in response to 
Leslie's urging that we niche this project in the larger context of a business school lecture. So what are the incentives that inform how businesses, governments, and civil society think about this stakeholder consultation framework? We have a number of challenges. The increasing fragility of common pool resources. The people who are doing contracting for your university are pressed by students who are increasingly concerned about the environmental impact of the products we use. Systemic instability of political and social stresses that beset our entire planet. Growing inequality, the United States is increasingly, if we did a Gini coefficient, growing more unequal. I'm from Connecticut. It's the first or second most unequal state in the United States. And then the challenge of collective action on a very abstract level, simply engaging in collective action is difficult, we know in theory, but in practice that's extremely difficult as we respond to these kinds of challenges that beset us globally. And then for businesses, in amidst this incredibly complex environment, the challenge of brand reputation and innovation. Um, reputational management and insurance. So the puzzle, and I'm going to do a social science talk, today a little bit to show you how this book comes together as a piece of social science. Uh, the puzzle that motivated me, as Michael said, my work has been some of the foundational work in bringing these economic rights to the fore in our human rights lexicon and practice in the United States. If we ask people uh, what they think human rights are in the US, they often think about civil and political rights, the right not to be discriminated against or tortured or otherwise. But economic rights are equally important. And so I'm curious as to whether this phenomenon, this mechanism of stakeholder dialogue, can be an effective remedy for economic rights violations that are faced by people in communities affected by late manufacturing. The definition of economic rights is important, and so I'm going to signal three aspects to it, because I want to make sure we're all on the same page. So any economic right includes the right to basic subsistence, food, shelter, etc., the right to work, both in decent working conditions and in equal access to work in non-discriminatory setting. And Michael's work, finally, the right to basic income guarantees for people who cannot work, and employment insurance and other forms of social guarantee. And when I talk about social safety nets, for many Americans, those are pretty narrow. But in many other parts of the world, those safety nets are broader. Um, when we think about economic rights at the end of the production line, we're impacting detrimentally or positively the lives of many people impacted by the production occurring or not occurring at the factory moves very quickly, as I'm going to argue, happens often in light manufacturing. And those kinds of rights can be really significantly impacted. So Tethered Fates explores a number of different types of methods and types of modes of inquiry. Um, it explores this new norm. As Michael said earlier, I'm a scholar of norms emergence. The contribution that I've been trying to make for some time to, look to the literature is to look at how new human rights norms emerge. I often argue that some of the people at the very grassroots popular level have a lot more impact than we would think they do on norms emergence. So this norm of a notion of remedy, that people are entitled to remedy if they're harmed in the course of business doing business internationally. Um, that stakeholder consultation then is a key mechanism that can ensure the enjoyment of that right, both for preempting harm and then for redressing it when it occurs. So seeking to head that harm off at the past, but then also addressing it if it occurs. And that much of my research in this project reveals that a lot of the consultation we do is still animated from the top down. That we aren't necessarily consulting <coughs> people directly impacted at the community level by these practices. And I'm particularly interested as a scholar of social mobilization and social movements in the opinions and um, ideas of people at the very grassroots level. And finally, I really want to look pragmatically. I don't just want to critique for the sake of critique. I want to think with people who would be involved in governance, both at the corporate level and in, in government and in non-governmental settings and civil society, about how we might change then a process that, to the, to the moment, is quite top-down, and think about form and content of that consultative prospect, uh, process so that we integrate the cost of community engagement into the business function itself. Yes? A clarification question. So this right to remedy, um, this is kind of the rocky principles of. Yes, the and that's the next right. slide. You're so smart. You oh. <laughs> that is my exactly John Ruggie. So your chair of the center knows 
John Ruggie was the dean of Columbia when Michael and I were studying there at varying points. He's a very storied political, theor uh, political scientist and IR scholar who went on to a very illustrated career at the United Nations. And so this emerging norm of remedy grows out of a piece of soft law, non-ratifiable but nonetheless very influential the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And I look at those principles then as an evidence of a normative shift and try to interrogate how do those norms then affect real people in real ways. Um, I want to spell out, because not everybody knows as much as CB or others do about the Ruggie principles, what do they entail? They say three things. The first of all, the state has an affirmative duty to protect your rights from harm by non-state actors, which in some cases in developing countries, the annual operating uh, uh, corporation's revenues are higher than the GDP of the country itself. So the state has this affirmative obligation, both in the country of origin of the company, but also in the host country to protect your rights, that the corporation itself is responsible for respecting the law, both in the country of its headquarters, but also in the places where it does business and all along the supply chain. And then thirdly, that the victims of problems have a right to remedy, and that that remedy is co-constructed by government and business. Okay? And this new normative framework emerged in the early 2000s through great uh, consultation and engagement of John Ruggie through the UN's Human Rights Council and is now part of a lexicon of how international companies think about doing business. It's not ratified by states but was universally endorsed. And so my interest was, is it making a difference in how people think about remedy at this very local level, beyond the shop floor? Beyond the shop floor. Um, there's a big literature, I'll do this slide very quickly, this is to prove to the political scientists that this is really political <laughs> science, and so there aren't too many of them, so Michael's already a friendly traveler. But international norms relations, uh, international relations theory on norms evolution has been a big uh, literature in which I've engaged and many others. Um, quite a robust literature on human rights scholarship, on economic rights to which I and others have contributed, and Michael's and other colleagues' newer work, Brooke Ackerley and others, on what is the nature of just responsibility. And then political economy literature, there's a wonderful literature to which some business colleagues have contributed in addition to this group of colleagues in political science who do global political economy, international political economy. This literature that I'm trying to contribute to is also enriched by thinking about my work in that vein. And then a very robust and growing literature in business and human rights. And uh, this is a new field. It's both driven empirically and theoretically. And these are some of the scholars in that area, which probably a lot of you are already familiar with. But if people want to come back in Q&A, I can recommend why some of this work is so important. And so I see the work as a social scientist in, in a joint appointed position. I sit in the Department of Political Science and also the Human Rights Institute as my work is con contributing to a number of debates in my own field, but then across fields. The research design for this project is a lot of fun to talk about. So when I wrote this book, I thought, if I write a book that's under 250 pages, that can retail for $25, that's easy to read and fun, it will be bought, it will be used, and it will make a difference. But I also want it to be a serious piece of social science scholarship. So I want to use mixed methods. I want to have it be broadly legible to people in the policy community as much as it is academically important. And I want it to give voice to people at the grassroots level to mainstream their perspective with that of all of this top-down scholarship that exists on business and human rights. So the research design is threefold. First of all, there's a chapter that really traces the genealogy of this concept of stakeholder consultation. And it does so principally by using UN primary source documents and secondary source literature um, that looks at when we engage with stakeholders, we've done so pretty systematically over time. In the 80s, that was in a damage control mode. Companies in the 1980s, the Bhopal disaster, the Alexan Valdez spill, were often engaging with local community members only at the point of duress. In the 90s, as we had the emergence of the 24-hour news cycle, as we had the emergence of the internet, as we had the emergence of bringing victim testimony literally into our houses, we engaged with people at the end of the supply chain, but often as victims who came and told their story and then went away. We could click the channel off, or we could invite them on a reality tour to come, talk, and go home. And then in the 2000s, with the rise of this notion of Ruggie's principles, we had this notion of empowered remedy, where you're supposed to be part of this engagement as a victim who's entitled to remedy. But at each of those junctures, we often a bit clipped the wings of people at the grassroots level. And so I show that consistency across this genealogy. So that's the what in the world is stakeholder dialogue. Where did it come from? What's that concept? 
Then I wanted to map in a quantitative sense where in the world is it happening, in what sectors, in what industries, in what parts of the world. And so I use a large end data set that we talked about today that's publicly available, completely free. Any researcher can use it. The Business and Human Rights Resource Center, it's an award-winning resource center. Uh, 7,000 to now 8,000 companies, information freely and publicly available that students and I code, and I'm gonna show you some of the results. So what is Sickle Drive? Where is it happening preponderantly? What kinds of industries? What kinds of parts of the world? And then finally, who thinks what about it? And so I'm not gonna go interview corporate CEOs. Everybody's interviewed them to death in the context of the working principles. I'm not gonna go interview any more workers. I've interviewed a lot of workers in my career. I don't need to interview workers. I wanna interview everybody else impacted in those communities. I grew up in the Rust Belt in Michigan. I care about the people who no longer have a job if the factory went elsewhere. I'm particularly compelled by and interested in those people at the end of the hang tag, their neighbors, their friends, if they don't work there in that factory. So some of this qualitative interview work then, which is my sweet spot, scholarly work from my perspective is enriched when you do things that force you to stretch. And so the, the quantitative work was done with wonderful research assistants. This qualitative work is really what I've um, cut my teeth on as a scholar, going into two communities where we could do, I could do interviews, 43 of them, across two sites where Yukon product is made, where the Husky Dog shirts come from. So I went into our supplier database and I looked at 2,500 potential factories and we picked two factories. One is very high profile, pays triple the, minute, the living wage, a minimum wage in the Dominican Republic, and that's its form of doing business and human rights. The other, literally only 40 minutes away, pays a conventional wage and does corporate philanthropy. Let's look at what people in those two different communities in the same manufacturing sector, in the same country, in the same export market, collegiate apparel, think about this concept of remedy. So a structured case comparison that matters because it's my Husky Dog shirt or your pit wear that's ultimately coming from that factory. So the 2,500 uh, sites, um, we looked at them today, you can download, we can look at our entire supplier base. I picked them very carefully to structure this comparison. And Bielta Gracia is the triple wage factory and Bonal is the conventional wage that's engaged in much more corporate philanthropy and worker, uh, worker training in conjunction with the Ministry of Labor, two very different ways of doing BHR, and then uh, community-based surveys, okay? And then I did participant observation at a conference we hosted in 2017, bringing together 30 to 40 participants through our Business and Human Rights Initiative from Latin America, from Asia, and from Europe and across the United States, who are doing human rights and business work in their scholarly life or in their contracting life like these folks, or our licensing partners. And so this was a two-day business and human rights conference at which I got the IRB's approval to also do participant observation, thinking about the policy implications then of this research. So that was a really interesting environment and a privilege to be able then to mainstream those and the policy implications chapter of the book draws very centrally on that participant observation and a white paper that was produced for the business community. So there's the what is stakeholder dialogue, there's the where in the world is it happening, there's who thinks what about it, both at the grassroots level and then in this more interdisciplinary context of academics, licensing partners, and others in the field. Okay. And I won't bore you now, but that's the website to the conference. All of the bios are there, the white paper is there, anybody who wants to know those folks are all there. So we, we've really put a primacy on saying that stakeholder engagement should be free and open and accessible and this project grows out of that spirit um, within the context of our human rights movement. Um, what did I find after doing all of this work? So as I, I'm gonna give you the cheat sheet and the quick findings and then I can go into the social science of the chapters. First of all, that there are a lot of constraints on contemporary state, stakeholder participation and that that's 80s, 90s, and 2000s, they are quite consistent. This is not a uniquely more complex era. These are echoes of existing challenges. Secondly, that the patterns of stakeholder dialogue when we look at that large end data are quite consistent. And I'm going to tell you about those patterns. Consultation, when we looked at those 7,000 different companies across regions and sectors, occurs principally in the extractive sector, where the cost of the resource is a sunk cost. Dwelling, dwelling, uh, drilling a well, heavy infrastructure involved in extractives or the prone nature of the resource itself means that the consultation is necessary because the nature of the resource itself is inherently bound. 
it's much less evident in light manufacturing. If I don't like the consultation involved in making this sweatshirt or t-shirt in the Dominican Republic, I can take my factory, container it in the weekend, and move it to Bangladesh. If I don't like what happens in Bangladesh, I can very quickly move it to Vietnam. If I don't like what happens in Vietnam, I'll move it to Kenya. It's extremely easy to barcode that inventory, to barcode and containerize. We have deep sea ports, and to move light manufacturing in the, in the garment sector anyway, much more easily. And so the threat of exit, to use A.O. Hirschman's idea from political science, is much higher in that sector. And we find this when we look across the 7,000 companies in the BHHRC data set. And these trends are pretty uniform across regions with slightly more preponderant consultation in Asia just because of the volume of light manufacturing happening in Asia. But the ratio is similar. Extractives predominate. And they're pretty consistent across regions. I can show you later and when we go into detail on Chapter 3 that. And we do this both with two years of hand coding and then with an API programming interface for machine coding. So that data is very, very robust. And it's part of a cumulative program of scholarship now happening at the University of Nottingham. We talked about this today. There are colleagues doing research in this area using APIs at scale, so with 70 to 80,000 observations. My work's only 7,000 companies, about 11,000 observations. So th what I'm excited for is this is kind of a boulder that's now rolling down the hill where people are saying, huh, how might I use that business and human rights resource da data more effectively? Um, we also find, I also find that the nature of prevailing consultation really precludes remedy. That most of the consultation happening is where, in a manner in which companies, not communities, are determining the fundamental definition of both what is appropriate to consult around and what is the nature of harm. If I'm going to consult you, I, the company, will call the consultation. I will ask at a given time and I will specify what is appropriate to include in the consultative frame and what is the nature of harm for purposes of damages in that co-construction of remedy. And that companies, not communities, are typically determining the temporal threshold with a view towards legal damages, right? How far back are we going to think about the damage that might have been impacting the community? I will determine that, not you. And that's challenging in economic rights more generally because who is at fault for underdevelopment in X or Y country? That's a very challenging piece that we think about quite often in the economic rights space. And finally, community level understandings of dialogue and remedy, I find through these interviews, are quite minimal. People aren't running around saying, like CB, who's John Ruggie and how should I be interacting with him? They have no notion of being um, entitled to this right to remedy. Um, there is some variation within the local communities, and it varies both with level of personal subjective socioeconomic status, how well am I off vis-a-vis -vis my neighbor, and also within communities based on hierarchies. The Bonao community that has a conventional factory is far more internally hierarchical than the Lielta Gracia community that I survey. Um, there's also a really important finding for you who are interested in BHR from Business and Human Rights from the B-School perspective that grows out of that two-day workshop that we did in 2017, that there are two very distinct and rival modes of consultation emerging. One is a very conventional, multi-stakeholder initiative, top-down model, which lots of companies are pouring lots of money into. And if you look at the reports for the UN Global Compact or the Sustainability Reporting, Social and Environmental, this is a very professionalized way of engaging, and lots of companies are doing that. And they typically mirror an emphasis on non-derogable civil and political rights, so the right not to be tortured, enslaved, the right not to engage in forced labor. There's lots of consultation happening around, around those high pressure, high visibility types of human rights that are very legible and very damning if the corporation is found to be engaged in them. There is much less consultation happening around economic and social rights. Um, this is very linked to a conventional understanding of brand value, right? If, if I end up on 60 Minutes because I've been found to have slave labor in Xinjiang, that's a problem. Um, and they're, they're grounded in sunk costs. Remember we said they happen much more typically in extractives because the sunk cost of building an oil well facility is much higher than containerizing my whole husky dog factory and moving on to the next place. So those parameters impact then why we see much conventional multi-stakeholder initiatives happening in the way they happen. The alternative path is this notion of worker-driven social responsibility where workers themselves co-construct some of the remedies and the governance structures. In the first factory in Vialta Gracia, the, the triple living wage factory, was born of struggle internal to the workplace mediated by the Workers' Rights Consortium and other student organizations who demanded a more ethical way of producing garments with a living wage. 
And that triple living wage, that triple wage factory only employs 200 people, the conventional one, 3,000. And so that worker-driven social responsibility model in the first case is mirrored in other industries. We see it in the Immokalee uh, tomato procurements in the United States, the Immokalee work worker struggle in Southern Florida. We see it in the Justice for Janitors campaign. We see it in a number of spaces where workers and community members themselves are co-constructing ways of talking about remedy for injustice. But those are challenging to replicate and to scale up. And so our two-day convening of colleagues across this BHR space who came to talk about stakeholder rights at the end of the line really grappled with how to unify or marry those two different approaches. And the book in its sixth chapter really looks honestly at trying to marry those two approaches instead of putting them as an either or. Many, many companies are already investing in multilateral, uh, multi-stakeholder engagement of the conventional sort. And many, many community groups, foundations, and others, the Open Society Institute and many others, are investing in worker-driven social responsibility. Kathy Odusa, a colleague of mine, and Michaels, who's involved in the National Economic and Social Rights Initiative, is a paragon of work on WDR, so worker-driven social responsibility. So how might we blend those types of approaches? Um, the implications of this kind of book, first of all, is that it, I think, really importantly fills a gap in understanding stakeholder perceptions because it brings workers' voices in those chapters four and five through these case studies directly to the table. And conventional literature on BHR has been very business school dominated. As you said, it's surprising to have this political scientist come talk about something that's being written out about a lot. And I'm not surprised at all that CB immediately asked about the work principles. This is a literature dominated by business scholars, not by political science scholars, and certainly not by social movement comparativists, right? So my interest was really bringing those people's voice to the fore and, and inserting it to include community members, somebody beyond workers, somebody beyond the logical person at the end of the supply chain who might be most immediately able to claim remedy. Secondly, that I wanted to historicize this process so the what in the world is stakeholder consultation would take us all the way back to the 80s, right? So that we would realize this isn't just something epiphenomenal that's happening in the current moment because John Ruggie merely got a good idea but that our business sector has evolved at a pace with globalization and changes in supply chain management and changes in technology, but is still beset with this need to grapple more realistically with stakeholder engagement. And then finally, that there are, as a political scientist, I'm concerned about who governs and how, if, if we have a duty to both protect and respect, how do we engage state and corporate duty bearers? And it's challenging to do so at the local level Many of my respondents, as I'm going to show you, felt that they had much more readily callable claims on government than on companies if they didn't work for them. And so this notion of diffusion and diffuse links, both perceptually and in reality, is something pretty significant that comes out of this study. And finally, this is a concept that grows out of my collaborative work with engineering. I, I'm a faculty liaison to our School of Engineering around our Engineering for Human Rights Initiative, which we talked a lot about at lunch with some colleagues in the School of Engineering here. Um, engineers have a lot of really wonderful uh, uh, telescopic abilities to very simply put a concept on the table and sort of throw down the gauntlet around that concept. And so failure prone settings is an idea that goes out of engineering, it goes out of civil engineering, it goes out of computer science and engineering. And I think it's very applicable in these highly failure prone settings in light manufacturing, where the risk of abuse is very high and the risk and the threat of exit is very high. And that here we want to look particularly at how to engage stakeholders more effectively in order to stabilize those failure prone settings from a social welfare standpoint and from a human rights standpoint. And so I'll talk a little bit in a separate slide about those kinds of ideas out of engineering around stabilizing that concept, that context. So now what I'm gonna do really quickly is go through a couple of the chapters. Um, I wanna go through very quickly the qualitative, quantitative findings, uh, two or three slides, and then a couple of slides on each of the case studies, and then I wanna really let us open up for uh, questions. This is simply to give people some thought about how you might want to engage this research or engage in similar kind of work. It's very interdisciplinary work, so I would invite comments. I know there are people in the room for business and engineering, political science, and other fields. So I'm very excited about my little quick social science encapsulation, but where it speaks to your own research. Um, I wanted to just give you a sense. In the first phase, we double blind coded this big 7,000 data set. Uh, 7,000 company data set, and in the first wave, we used its existing categories. This data set allows you to look at companies by industry, by sector, and by region. So we coded on industry, 
region and mode of consultation. How was the information about the company revealing what kind of consultation were they doing? Traditional stakeholder consultation, consultation with the keyword community, indigenous peoples, or other forms. And then in the second round, we integrated into this hand coding, and this was 18 months of hand coding with really great students who were doing this kind of coding with the HHRC <coughs> data, living wage, labor, and child labor, plus these modes above. And then we had eventually integrated company policies, advancing certain categories of activity steps and reporting, and we ran this on a subset of companies just to be sure with regional uh, variation that we weren't extremely um, weighted by one or the other large country in a single region, and we double-blind coded them. And then we developed an API which validated all of that hand coding, which was really exciting to be able to, as a social scientist, say, Yes, the hand coding is validated by what we're finding with this machine rating, and we used conjoint stories from within that data set to build a bigger data set of 11,000 data points where we could look at 189 countries, 11 industries, multiple mechanisms, complaint mechanisms, free prior and informed consent mechanisms, and impact assessment. And what we found, which is really exciting, is that we found this concentration, as I mentioned, in extractives consistently across regions by a significant ratio, and that complaint mechanisms, which involve workers on site, were the dominant consultative form. Not free and prior informed consent with, with community members, and not post hoc engagement with community members, but this dominant form was really complaint mechanisms on site with workers only. And that a number of key countries, and this would be fun to do with people who do more qualitative case-based work, account for a lot of the consultation. China, India, Malaysia, Bangladesh, and light manufacturing, and then Indonesia, India, uh, Philippines, and Myanmar, and extractives. So some really interesting potential future work could be done looking within single countries, etc. cetera. Um, this is a table from the book that just shows you in a gross sense the preponderance in extractives. And we did look at pharmaceutical and water and found much, much less consultation when coding in this really rigorous way, which is also very interesting because if you just do case studies in the BHR literature, it looks like all sorts of things are happening in one or the other sector. But when you begin to really look across a large end data set, you see these patterns are quite prominent. Um, there was a parallel analysis I carried out of NGO literature that found very similar patterns, even though the samples were much smaller. So SHIFT, which is John Ruggie's own NGO based in New York, did some work around uh, 43 companies looking at where stakeholder consultation was happening, and they found the same types of patterns, both by region and sector, that we did. And the OECD Watch, which is another major European-based NGO, looked upwards of 250 different types of consultative mechanisms and found similar patterns. And then finally, MSI Integrity, based up in the Boston area, um, did an analysis of 45 consultations and found very similar. So extractives are preponderant, pretty similar ratios across regions, light manufacturing much less so. Um, <clears throat> they found very similar things on the nature of the consulting, uh, consultation process. So I'm going to move ahead. I can certainly come back, but I just want to show you two slides each on the country case studies and then a wrap-up slide, and then I really know we're getting late, so I want to move time for Q&A. Um, very quickly. Santo Domingo, the capital of the DR, I wish I had a pointer, is here at the base. That very dark uh, highway line across the industrial spine of the country is the um, manufacturing kind of gateway for the Dominican Republic. It runs north-south, Highway 1. It's the oldest industrial highway. And so we Alta Gracia and Bonao are within an hour of the capital. So these are really conventional manufacturing towns, fast to get products to market. And the Alta Gracia is in the state of San Cristobal, and this model factory, through worker-driven responsibility over a number of years, with mediation from the Workers' Rights Consortium, student groups, universities, and others, and the unions on site, has forged this model of worker-driven social responsibility. It's in a town that's pretty small, 84,000 inhabitants, and it only employs 200 people. And those people make 283 an hour compared to the national minimum wage of 83 cents an hour. So the folks who get those jobs consider themselves very fortunate, but it's a tiny drop in a larger ocean of underemployment. And I should note that Belta Gracia is the most violent city in the Dominican Republic by U.S. State Department fact factors, in part because there are daily power outages in both of these communities for up to two to three hours a day. And in Belta Gracia, they occur every night because the power grid is very faulty during the dusk hours. 
So this contributes to really significant social unrest and lack of well-being. And this is a town that has had cyclical departure of large manufacturing companies over its lifetime. Um, the active engagement of unions and the Workers' Rights Consortium, a multi-stakeholder group, on site within the factory has meant this worker-driven <coughs> social responsibility model is the one that predominates here. But now is different. It's almost twice the size. It's 40 minutes a little further north. It's in a neighboring state. And it's a site where a conventional factory, Haynes has six factories throughout the country, each employing thousands of workers in a 24-hour high lean manufacturing setting, making textiles, just the raw textile for the garments, which go into blanks, which are procured then where we embellish Pitt's logo or Yukon's logo or elsewhere. Um, doing conventional manufacturing, employing a bigger portion, but still a small proportion overall of the population, and paying a conventional minimum wage, and then carrying out corporate philanthropy with that bust you saw in the first slide, remember, doing ear, eye, nose, and throat training for doctors in the local hospital to diagnose ENT problems and taking four to five kids every year to Wake Forest Baptist Hospital in the Carolinas to have surgeries. And so screening kids across the six communities where it has factories and then paying into um, getting a GED or other forms of worker training in collaboration with the Ministry of Labor. So getting a little bit of a tax write-off in, in order to provide free high school completion education and other worker training for its workforce at these factories in partnership with the Ministry of Labor. So a very different way of doing corporate engagement around these issues. And the neighborhood where I did survey work was a comparably poor neighborhood because I wanted it to be a comparable type of sample and this was built around snowball samples from local contacts within these respective communities. So looking at a relatively poor community. What do we learn in these two communities? So each slide is going to show you some lessons learned and you're going to see some commonalities and some distinctions across the two. There's a widespread lack of information in both of these communities about business and human rights principles and about the notion of the right to remedy. Um, at the very local level, people who don't work for Haynes or for Alta Gracia Corporation don't know a lot about the company's practices more generally. Um, most non-workers in the Alta Gracia don't view themselves as being entitled to engage in the discussion of remedy with the factory. Um, it's paradoxical because this worker-driven social responsibility has really brought that factory into existence. Nor do they really expect that labor unions or the factory itself owe them anything. However, they are very emphatic that they have citizenship rights. They're frustrated with corruption in their own government. They're frustrated with, they, with what they perceive as sweetheart deals between the government and other businesses that have come or left from the community. They're incredibly frustrated with low enforcement of basic labor law and under development. They're terribly perturbed by a lack of infrastructure support for things like basic sanitation, water, and uh, power, right? And they have little time to engage in consultation for the sake of consultation. They're very pragmatic. Poor people spend an inordinate amount of their time carrying out multiple other things. I always tell people, poor people are the busiest people I've ever met in most of the cases I've done research because they're fetching water, they're making sure that they put a generator on or load share with a neighbor. They're incredibly busy just trying to work in the informal end if they have a job in the very formal sector. So they don't want to engage in stakeholder engagement if all they think it's going to do is make some company look good at their expense. They're really not interested unless there's a pragmatic value to it. Um, finally, they have very creative ideas about how companies could add more social value to their communities, both for the workers themselves and for everyone else impacted. In Bonao, Bonao is a very different community. Remember, it's not a factory with a triple living wage factory. It's a factory with a big and conventional manufacturing operation. Um, the idea of a living wage hasn't circulated even 40 kilometers north. If I said to people, oh, I was just in the Alta Gracia, people would say, why would you go there? What on earth is interesting in the Alta Gracia? I'd say, well, you know, there's this triple living wage. What are you talking about? What is that? And so there was very little mutual understanding of the triple wage factory. They thought it was wonderful. They wished there was such a similar factory in their own community. Um, the neighborhood associations in Bonao play a very key gatekeeping role, according to my respondents, in netting out jobs. So unlike the Vialta Gracia experiment, where in the Alta Gracia factory there was an open hiring process that was very publicly announced and very publicly conducted, in Bonao, for sake of expediency, Haynes has dealt with local neighborhood associations as the interlocutor for jobs. I'll, I'll send out a call to the juntas, 
they'll send me 30 resumes and I'll send back 15 candidates. What that perpetuates is a notion of favoritism. Local people say, if you're not on the good side of the president of the Junta de Latinos, or they would color off and the owner of the Junta, you don't get a job, or your kids don't get a job. And so that perpetuates what I call in a current paper I'm working on, a two-level game, we see in social science literature, a game where companies are attracted to places they perceive, local respondents perceive, by political favoritism between politicians at the top and factory owners, and then where jobs are afforded through patronage and clientelism. Um, residents have much less internalized, they have internalized ideas of needs assessment, but they have a much less expansive vision than people in Alta Gracia would of the realm of the possible. They're in a conventional <coughs> manufacturing setting. They can't imagine a job paying triple the minimum wage or having an on-site presence of the workers' rights consortium. And so they really have not thought through what the alternatives would be. Many, because of this preponderance of this second level game going on, perceive any kind of consultation process as a zero sum game. If you consult with the company, you too might get special resources, but you won't share them with your neighbor. So it sets up a very, very negative dog eat dog kind of zero sum context. And gender disparities are quite pronounced in Bonau. Women play leadership roles in the labor union and in the organizing of the workers' rights uh, process in the Alta Gracia in a way they have not in Bonau. The DR has a very low overall rate of immunization anyway compared to other parts of Latin America, but in Bonau in particular, the gender disparities were very pronounced. In the worker training that was happening, subsidized by Haynes, men tended to do much more um, remunerative types of training. I'm going to get certified in IGED and then I'm going to get electrical certification. Women would do you know, conflict resolution or something else that didn't have an immediate benefit to them in, mar in marketability of their skills. And finally, community members here too had really creative ideas of how the corporation could engage more effectively. And so I'm gonna end this and then go to one more slide and then open up. Um, the great vignette I'd love to share with people is in interviewing one community member in Bonao. She said, listen, we are so tired of backpacks. Every year the company comes to the community and we give everybody's kid a backpack. My kid has about four backpacks. What I wish they would do in Bonao they sequence our, our power outages on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, they're from 11 to 1, and on Tuesdays and Thursdays they're from 3 to 5, at least they're not at night, like in the Alta Gracia. But I wish they put solar panels on the factory, because then we could load share, and the factory wouldn't blow the, all that nasty diesel fuel into the air and pollute our air, and we wouldn't have to deal with no way to power up anything from the hours of X to Y. And we would love it if our kids had a place to study where they could plug in a computer or plug in a phone or go with light to study. So why not stop giving us all these backpacks every year, which we know are very convenient, right? Because I'm sure somebody got them in Walmart and then we sent them in a big container that came down with fabric, and everybody gave away backpacks and there were lots of nice pictures and went back to the corporate report, to the glossy report, and said we'd help the community with basic education. But the community isn't interested in any more backpacks. The community is tired of breathing diesel fuel for a factory that runs 24-7 with multiple power cuts every day, 24-7. And so they're much, much more interested in load sharing on a solar panel that would both provide clean air for Haynes and its premises, but also be possible to use in a kind of um, a collective good sense for them. And this is from a respondent with barely a high school education. These are very sophisticated ideas that I'm sure somebody at Haynes would love to know if they were consulting differently. And so part of what I think we see as the policy implications are first we need new strategies to engage community members themselves and the government as a party responsible for providing remedy. The government of the Dominican Republic has a problem with the power grid. It needs all you good engineers to go and help it figure out how to build a sustainable power grid. That cannot be done by Haynes. Maybe a power grid can help with a community center, but the sustainability of the power grid of the DR is a challenge for government. Business has to create, though, a fund of resources through taxes and other types of things, and we see this in the SDGs debate, to enable the government to do its job. Secondly, we need new mechanisms for extending that right to participation beyond the workforce. If workers themselves are engaged, that's great, that's wonderful, that's certainly happening in the Alta Gracia factory, but we need to be thinking about how those other stakeholders impacted at the community level or how our own procurement officials and others are conveying, as we've talked about today, the message that this is within your grasp, that's a consuming public, pennies on the dollar enable people to have a living wage. Pennies on the purchase dollar, right? Thirdly, we need new forms of remedy, including collective goods provisioning, like the power example. 
Instead of individual backpacks and individual surgeries, we need collective goods provisioning. Finally, we really need a renewed recognition of the interdependence of rights. I'm a broken record on why economic rights are human rights, too. Torture, detention, disappearance, and things are all incredibly important, but these economic rights are the bread and butter of the daily lived experience of many of the people in these kinds of communities. And finally, this is my last engineering little footnote, if we have these uncertain circumstances in which we have highly failure-prone settings, Engineers have this wonderful three-part notion of how to stabilize those failure-prone settings. Lots of people in computer science engineering do this all the time in thinking about stabilizing that setting. We diagnose things better, we predict problems, and we can approximate solutions. And you guys are smiling because you totally know this framework, right? That framework, I said to Krishna Padapati, my brilliant colleague in computer science and engineering, can be adapted by social scientists because if we learn to listen to people at the grassroots level, A, we're going to understand what went wrong. What is going wrong in the community of Guanao with its power grid? What kinds of problems could arise from that? Why is Rio Tegracia so violent? It's violent because it's dark every night from 7 to 9 p.m. What do you think happens when you cut out the lights in an entire community of 89,000 people every night from 7 to 9 p.m.? Furthermore, the approximate solutions, is this going to solve the entire problem of the power grid of the Dominican Republic? No. But in the short to medium run, it's going to make a dramatic difference, right? And so those kinds of incrementalist, approximate solutions are really helpful. And so that is my final slide. And that gives us a little bit of time, hopefully, for Q&A. So thank you very much for giving me the chance to share this And when they ask a question, just introduce yourself by name and tell me where you're from in the university, which field or which part of the university are you from. And I have my trusty colleague here. Let me see the mic. Who's going to be brave first? <coughs> okay. So when you, when you speak of the, when you speak of remedy, when you use the, the term the concept of remedy, um, so you're speaking more broadly than uh, pecuniary, monetary remedies, and uh, maybe equitable remedies uh, in the form of some kind of cease and desist order to stop activities that are harmful. It sounds like your opinion on the subject is much broader. Than right, right. So are you a business school? I, I am. I'm, I'm, I'm in business school. Okay. I teach Excellent. Uh, business ethics. Right okay, now. so so there's an immediate sort of short run cease and desist that would apply certainly under the Ruggie framework around those non-derogable violations. So a great example would be prejudicial hiring. When the Vialta Gracia case study factory, the Alta Gracia factory did hiring, it knew that pregnant women were consistently screened out of labor force. And my first book deals very explicitly with this along the US-Mexico border. So we had an open hiring policy where all the candidates' names were broadcast and then they were asked to parade in front of people to enter the factory. And visibly pregnant women were entering the factory for interviews, which community members said was unheard of. These people were always screened out of the labor force. So if there's an, an overt form of discrimination, or if there's an overt form of union harassment or other things happening, that's where there's a cease and desist in immediacy. There's a remedy for that in the manner in which you design the hiring protocol. But these larger questions around, as we were saying today in our conversation, what is corporate philanthropy if it's only a PR opportunity for the company to send yet another shipment of discount backpacks, does it get to be counted, for example, in your coding, as Mike and I were talking about earlier today, as something we consider to be business and human rights activity, or is that purely enrichment activity for the corporation on a brand value? Um, and so I think what it pushes us to think about a little bit more is expanding the scope of what counts as remedy in a meaningful sense. I would also say unionization and the ability to make a living wage. It, it encumbers the company with the responsibility to do enough research to know what a living wage would be. And so in the first case, the factory had a lot of support and assistance from the Workers' Rights Consortium to go door to door, to work with community groups in deciding that that 283 was the minimum that it would take for someone to be able to provide housing, school uniform for their child, basic transportation, <coughs> caloric intake sufficient to be comfortable and healthy. It's not a Cadillac, it's not a three-story house, but it's the basic right with, uh, to ex economic access to a job that affords a margin of dignity, this living wage, which is very different from the national minimum wage of 83 cents an hour. 
So it encumbers the company if it's going to do serious work around remedy for workers' rights with the responsibility to do the due diligence to know what that living wage is. So it ceases and desists from pregnancy screening related discrimination in the hiring process. But then it has this affirmative duty to collect enough data so that it knows how to do living wage effectively. And that's this diagnostic work coming out of the notion of engineering. It's never going to figure that out based in North Carolina because it knows not who to ask. And so that idea that you're co-constructing the remedy with community members is very significant, especially in the area of living wage. Thank you. You guys are very quiet. And then you kind of go, yeah. Okay, so you found our research, you interview people and get all the data, and come up with some policy implication. Did you do anything after that? I mean, you know, it's like a very straightforward thinking that you need yeah. the solar panel. And, uh, no, you know, this is so interesting. I published this book in April, and now what I just gave a talk last week at University of Michigan, what I was asked there by somebody at the Ross School of Business there was, great, now you've thrown down the gauntlet. What do you think businesses can do to make this happen? And so my first suggestion is you need to hire a different kind of person within your firm who has the right skill set. Michael and I and others have talked about where do, and today we talked about this, where do our students place? Where do our students go who have this global studies training or in my case a human rights minor or major? They should be being hired by businesses to be your eyes and ears. When I teach my class on a supply chain assessment with engineering, I always tell my engineering students you will be better placed to go out into the field and be far more effective in looking at supply chain integrity than somebody who only knows how to design the widget process. You're going to think much, much more holistically. So part of what I, I thought about a lot in response to Susan Waltz's comment from Michigan was the first step might just be thinking in a much more interdisciplinary way about what type of skills businesses need if they're going to effectively take this kind of responsibility, this larger scope of remedy on. They already have a good corporate counsel who can think very clearly about how to delimit the scope for the immediate run harms that they have to address. But if they are going to co-construct a much more effective way of doing affirmative hiring or of doing a living wage calculation, they just can't do it with somebody who's only been trained in a very conventional way. And so part of the challenge for me is thinking about how to entice students with these kinds of core competencies in global studies or human rights or other fields within engineering elsewhere to think about this creative design process as a potential career path. It's a very different career path from a conventional um, business team approach. And I think it's a really exciting opportunity. It's a growth area. We have an increasing number of students who are multilingual, who have really great grassroots experiences through internships and other practical training, who are bicultural and want to do this kind of work. But we haven't yet made it clear to them that you're interesting and necessary and valued in this kind of space. And I think that this area of business and human rights, this stakeholder dialogue, is a natural fit for that kind of hire. Um, so I believe that you know, traditionally, you know, people doing the empirical research usually use a uh, regression kind of approach yeah. and are predictive. So I believe mm -hmm. by this uh, internet age, we talk about business analytics and that they incorporate heavily on the optimization. And that means you prescribe. So in right. addition to the predictive, you actually need the prescriptive yeah. you know, yeah. analytics as well. Yeah, and so that's one of the reasons we were so eager to have this um, API for the Business and Human Rights Resource Center data. There had been no use of that data in a large computing sense. And I'm a qualitative scholar, but I built a little research team where we could at least put our large toe in the water and then hand that off to these colleagues at the University of Nottingham who have this large, large data set project. And we're going to be doing a, a, a sort of developments in the field note for um, Cambridge Business and Human Rights Journal. Um, just to introduce people to the possibility of using this data in that manner. But I agree with you, there's a lot more need to mainstream this kind of analysis into the quantitative studies um, that, are, that are out there and available. And if you look to remember when I was looking at MSI integrity or the OECD watch or others, those samples are tiny, 43, 250. They're just the common conventional wisdom has been do a case study. But I just don't think that allows you to do a lot of predictive work. And yet, I didn't want to only do a large end project, A, because I'm not suited to it, but B, because I didn't want to lose the voices 
of those community members as complementing the full scope of what the, the project could offer. Yeah. Other questions? Just to clarify. No, so yeah, Dean first. <laughs> <laughs> Center directors first. Ah. Uh, okay. no, is the current person like an ombudsman or an ombudsman who, who, who actually represents the company in the mediation process? Is this person on the company roles? It depends very significantly. So the, the case studies that are specific give companies some sort of advice and models on how to do this. Sometimes it will be corporate counsel folks, sometimes it will be an outside broker. Um, there have been a range of approaches. Uh, one of the most contentious examples in the extractive sector that I really don't research in great depth, but Tyler Giannini at Harvard Law has done a lot of writing on is the settlement for Porgero where women were raped in the context of extractive work that was going on in, um, in the environs of uh, gold extraction. And two different groups of women were given very different remedies some at a much higher rate of compensation who sued independent of the brokered agreement, which another group of, of, of litigants, non-litigants, but informal mechanism, had afforded them a much lower rate of compensation. And so who brokers that consultation, whether it's inside or outside of the court system? Ruggie's very clear on saying remedy can be justiciable remedy, it can be non-justiciable remedy. If it's going through the courts, that's one set of actors who are gonna mediate it for the company. If it's not, then as you say, who is, who is equipped to consult with the community? It can be brokered through local NGOs, but as we saw from the Junta de Vecinos, who does that Junta represent? Myself, my friends, and my nephew who gets the job, or the community more broadly. So this is really challenging. And often, I look back to my first book, which Michael had mentioned, which dealt with child labor in Bangladesh's garment sector. When children were identified in the early, uh, early 90s in the factories in Bangladesh, Figuring out what to do with them was really problematic. The factories were dumping them out the back door, and 40 or 50,000 of them were summarily underemployed, and then went to much worse settings, right? So it had to broker with Reda Barna, which is the Swedish Save the Children, and with local NGOs to actually place those children at its expense in more optimal settings. But the company person in New York had no idea what to do with these kids. Just shut the door, maybe they won't come back. But you have an affirmative responsibility to do something. And so in the memorandum of understanding brokered in that case, it was between the ILO, its local monitoring body in Bangladesh, the Garment Manufacturers Association, Save the Children, and UNICEF, because they could collectively outsource the responsibility to the right types of schools. And the schools set up to deal with those working children who are now doing other kinds of work, many of them from poor families or children without a, a formal family setting, had to be night schools. They couldn't imagine going to school during the day because many of them were carrying on less harmful work in the course of their daytime activities. And so sometimes what happens in these kinds of non-justiciable remedies is that the company ends up having to work like with Red Barna or UNICEF or other partners because it just doesn't have the skills on site to know how to construct the remedy. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid this is sort of a bit of an untutored question, yeah. but early in the talk you mentioned this, what seemed to me to be sort of two different strategies, preempting harm as opposed to redress mm -hmm. if harm occurs. Yeah. And I'm, uh, you know, I could see these as being very much interrelated, you mm -hmm. know, like one happens and then the other yeah. one tries to yeah. prevent it. Yeah. But I wondered what you've learned in your case studies or studies in general as to whether this would allow us, let's say with students, to come up with a strategy that is definitely focused on preempting as opposed to the redress. Yeah. Because to me, this kind of reminds me of sort of the quality of the source yeah. stuff that you, you'd rather not have it yeah. occur than to fix it. Yeah. yeah, and I think that it's a great question because it's a continuum. So in the case of for example, in the case of setting up this triple wage factory, people knew that pregnancy screening was legion in this sector. It's throughout Latin America, in part because Latin American countries have an affirmative obligation under labor law to paid maternity leave. The US does not, and so if somebody's subcontracting elsewhere, they just assume hire them, not hire those people so they don't have to affirmatively pay for maternity leave. 
And so by affirmatively saying, I'm going to head that problem off at the pass by having this open hiring process where people's names are listed, and I rebut the idea of political actors in the DR were trying to claim credit for bringing these jobs, et cetera, and I say, no, this is co-constructed with the Workers' Rights Consortium, which at the behest of USAS and other organizations is negotiating for the opening of this factory, and now publicly you're going to get to see who the applicants are as they all show up at an appointed time and hour, and we're going to affirmatively say, we're not going to get caught in the same bind of this discriminatory mm -hmm. practice, mm -hmm. because these workers are entitled to consideration. Now, they may not be hired. They may not have the same skill set. But there, were, there was a very open recognition that preemptorily you could mm -hmm. change the manner in which the hiring was happening so that you're not then de dealing with redress, which is really, really significant. Mm -hmm. yeah. One more question? Yeah. Anybody? I have a question. Mike? I was Go for it. Yeah. Sure, thanks. This thank is, you. Uh, I, I wonder if you could, this is maybe a nerdy political science question, so I saved it for the end, but could you talk about the relationship between the two-level game that's being played and then the community residents seeing what they faced as a zero-sum yes. game? I just found that sort of intriguing. Yes, um, and Wednesday when I do this paper, I'm going to talk about that. But there are sort of two levels that residents, and I should preface this by saying the Dominican Republic, if we looked at the um, rankings and business confidence that we see in The Economist or elsewhere, scores very low because it's highly corrupt. It's a country that's affirmatively <coughs> highly corrupt. And so these public perceptions of corruption are not erroneous. They're very real. So the first level game people perceive is that politicians play games to diminish regulatory um, strength in order to entice manufacturing to the sector. They lower minimum wage requirements, they bust unions, they do a myriad of things. And that they play favors in affording special arrangements to bring particular factories to particular communities. So this is a sort of executive level game. We're going to get you to come to our EPZs, and we're going to cite our EPZs and preferentially address the concentration of labor based on political favoritism. So whoever the party is in power will arbitrage, essentially, and get factories to come to the DR by lowering labor regulations, and then by affording preferential access to factories citing based on political connections. So that's the first game. Whether that's true or not, but it's the perception. The second game, people say, is then local level political operatives, not state senators, but local level hacks in the local political machinery are going to make dirty deals behind closed doors with people like those members of the Junta de Vecinos. And whether that's true or not, some juntas were perceived as more credible than others. And those are the kinds of brokering relationships that are going to enable sweetheart deals for individual people who get on that main 15-person name list to have job interviews. And so the two-level game is, one, I'm going to bring jobs here based on political favoritism, and two, I'm going to allocate the actual hiring practice through a highly preferential set of second level games. That was much more, that second game was much more prevalent and perceived in Bonal than in Bialta Gracia. And so what's interesting about that is that creates an incredible level of cynicism about individual people's political agency. And I talk about in that paper, which I'll talk about on Wednesday, literally people invoke the idea that the president needs to bring jobs to my town. That somehow if I leapfrog into the president's sala, the you know, living room, I will get the job to come to my community, and then I'll be able to play favors with the right people in this intermediate level. And that means it's a very zero-sum game. The president isn't interested in general public welfare. The president isn't interested in public goods provisioning. The president isn't interested in equitable development. The president is only interested in getting reelected, and the threat of non-reelection means he has to, it's always he, has to play favors with all of these actors. And so it's a complete zero-sum dog dog game because I have no interest in collective welfare. It's all about me getting access to that job. And what's also important to signal to people from the from the book is that the Dominican Republic went through an, a massive retrenchment in its attractiveness as a site of offshore manufacturing for textiles during the past 10 to 15 years. So it went from having a very dominant place in global light manufacturing to a much more circumscribed place as other markets evolved. And so that kind of zero-sum game is even more augmented. 
and its levels of inequality have increased and its level of overall poverty has increased when adjusted for inequality. So, so it's a context where that zero sum becomes all the more pernicious because it's a context where light manufacturing as a whole, this export-oriented light manufacturing, low-skill manufacturing, is diminished in general because of global trade shifts and where then those gains become more pronounced, right, in, a, in an increasingly miserated context. So there's a very interesting context in which to look at this model factory of 200 people because it's a tiny drop in a much larger setting, 89,000 residents in that first community, all vying for some option of working in such a place. Right? So really challenging context. Yes. Awesome. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you very much, Shreen. And um, if we can please thank Dr. Hertel one more time.